Welcome to As the Story Grows. I'm Brian Patton. Today we welcome Nick Sages from Tribe of Pazuzu to the podcast. Tribe of Pazuzu released Blasphemous Prophecies back on March 6th via Vic Records. Nick talks about being around for the birth of death metal, how he distinguishes writing for Tribe of Pazuzu versus Nihilist Death Cult, the lyrical themes and inspirations for Blasphemous Prophecies, and more. This conversation was a lot of fun, and it was cool getting to talk to someone with a long history in the metal scene. On Patreon, I'm launching Mosh Mixes, a radio show of sorts featuring tracks I'm currently digging. Patreon.com slash As The Story Grows. Enjoy today's chat with Nick Sages from Tribe of Pazuzu. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Okay. If you're from Toronto, you have to say Toronto, though. Okay. All right. Well, I'm not, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, most people learn, I guess, but, uh, you know, Toronto, Canada, nice little place here. Nice. nice. How, <laughs> how, how are things in Toronto currently? Uh, yeah, it's not, I don't like it, though. No. no. <laughs> like how, like, just like general or? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, uh it's just getting pretty crowded, you know. Like, uh, I mean, there's like a lot of people uh, coming here now, so there's uh, just kids getting, it's getting insane. Like, you're an hour away from everything now. Like, no uh, matter where you are, there's memes out there that say Toronto, where you're an hour away from Toronto. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, I, I understand. I grew up and I'm living again in uh, Washington D.C. Oh and, yeah, uh, yeah. It's like what counts as D.C. just gets farther and farther away. It's the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is getting yeah. bigger for sure. Everywhere's getting bigger now. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Where'd you grow up? Uh just uh just right next to the Toronto, like a little place, Scarborough. It's uh that's where I guess it was most of the went to school and stuff like there there. So it's just a small little just right next to it, so it's not really yeah. far away, you know. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What was uh growing up like? <clears throat> it was uh, it was it was calm, it was nice. Uh you know, I mean it was the the eighties were like that's when it seemed like things were starting to happen, you know, like, yeah. we, I mean, also like you're getting older and you can do things. You're not like, just like a kid learning mm -hmm. and you gotta be with your parents all the time. Right. So like yeah. you know, you're growing up and you're seeing things and you're getting out there. And you know, that's when I we first started playing shows downtown and stuff and, you know, opening up your own world, like going from a smaller place like Scarborough to downtown and you're like, Oh wow, there's clubs and bands and people hanging out. And <laughs> yeah. so, you know, just that kind of thing. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun actually back yeah. then. That's right. Yeah, it's always awesome. You've talked to people and everyone's like, oh, they like metal. They must have had some disturbed childhood. And it's like, everything was great and sunshine. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, it's just like a cathartic thing, right? I mean, yeah. it's not like, a, you know, like a, a, an attitude or a mindset. Well, I mean, it is, but it's not yeah. like, you know, not the negative aspects of it where you're killing people or whatever. Right, right. <laughs> That's just yeah. like horror movie stuff, right? It's all fantasy, right? So, yeah. 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 What, uh, what got you into music? What got me into music? You know what? I, as far as I can remember, like, I mean, you listening to like, probably like watching a kiss video, I'm sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I, knew, I remember being in, interested in music and stuff like that and hearing stuff on the radio and, you know, I like this song. I don't like this song, you know, your first kind of ideas of stuff mm -hmm. and, and uh, watching videos on uh, some programs. There wasn't a, metal programs back then this was like the 70s right so yeah. it was like uh i remember around 78 79 getting into the heavier stuff my mom bought me like a cassette recorder with am fm on it so i used to start taping songs off his of shows and looking you know looking around for uh, radio stations and stuff and uh so you know that's when i got into like a lot of rock stuff but i, I yeah. i'm sure it was like a video uh, watching kiss and you're just like yeah. see these guys they're like larger than life and and you're and you know playing these instruments and you're like well, i want to do that you know that that looks fun yeah. <laughs> you know so i would probably say something like that but i didn't start playing until maybe like four three four years later so right. uh but the seeds were already kind of set you know like even when we were 
uh, pretending we were kids, like miming, you know, just like the kids, uh, like me and our cousins and my brother and stuff. And, uh, you know, I was always Gene Simmons for some reason. So <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, it was just one of those, I guess I started with the bass infatuation, right. From, from then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that, I mean, would you credit Gene Simmons as like your draw to bass or was it just like <clears throat> guitars too fucking hard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I never, I never even played guitar. I just, oh, I just, yeah. I was, like, I didn't try it first and then decide bass. I just, like, I, just, for some reason, just, the, I was drawn to the bass. And I don't know if it was Gene Simmons, <laughs> yeah, you know, but I mean, it was, it, it was in there. Like, it was him and maybe like, uh, uh, there's Pink Floyd and, uh, Rush at the same time, even though those guys are a bit more technical and proggy, especially Rush, obviously. Like, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't really differentiate back then. I was just like, oh, this guy could play bass and sing. Yeah wow, that's, uh, that's something, you know, like, you know, then most of those guys are writing their lyrics too and the music. So, you know, I mean, that kind of rubbed off on me as well. And even a little bit further, I would say Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. And that, that's when it actually kind of more clicked that I was just like, Oh, play with your fingers do all those kind of things. And that's, that's where I really started, you know, learning from these guys and like, you know, trying to be like that kind of style or something like metal, play metal. Yeah. So. yeah. Do you still play with your fingers? Oh yeah, yeah, I'll be, yeah, always. Uh, I, I've I play with picks once in a while, or like not play actually. I just practice once in a yeah. while, just like to try them because I do play a lot of guitar, and that's what I mostly write on. Yeah. So I tried to just transfer that idea, but uh, it's just it's <laughs> as soon as I get in, like I, I'm better with my fingers than with picks. So it's just like it's always like the fallback. I'm just like yeah. just start playing with my fingers and. Yeah, I always, I always appreciate people who can do that. Like my brother plays bass and he plays with his fingers, but I was a guitar player first, so I just I can I can't do it. Yeah, right. I noticed that too. Like if you play guitar first, it's usually go for the pick first because you could already you already have that pick control too, yeah. right? So yeah, you know I'm still working on it myself. Like I don't play enough that I have have it all down, but you know. Yeah, yeah. As you were getting like into music and starting to play, like. What was the scene like for like more extreme metal as like this is <coughs> burgeoning like death metal or thrash metal scene like rises to the top? What was getting you into that? Like how are you discovering that? Uh well, I'm a little bit older than yeah. <laughs> than, than you know, so I mean I was there during the formation of a lot right. of these scenes. Uh like uh when thrash metal started, I was like, you know, 13, 14 years old. And I remember, you know, listening to Exciter and uh Razor when like this is after you know, the Iron Maidens and the Judas Priests and stuff like that, The you know, just the regular heavy metal stuff yeah. and then getting into a little bit thrashier and just a little bit more aggressive and faster. And uh, the vocals started getting uh, raspier. And uh, and then then 85, you got Possessed and Celtic Frost and 86 was just everything came out of the, the, the most influential of uh, albums of, of my liking and of my uh, inspiration of what's of influences would be like 86 came out, you know, all the thrash stuff that came out, like your creator destruction, uh, possessed, uh, dark angel, uh, you know, slayer, rain and blood. I mean, these, these are pinnacle albums and it was a pinnacle time. And, and uh, those albums that came out in that year are just phenomenal and just left a lasting impression on me. And, and I like those albums more than, the rest of all those bands catalogs, you know, yeah. it, it was, it was always just the focus on those. It wasn't like a, like a, what band influenced you was what albums influenced me. So, but it was that. And then, and then it, then it progressed into like, you know, like 88, you heard, you know, 87, 88, her was death, you know, came out and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I wasn't blown away by them, but it was all right. And then I was 89 was when the real thing happened, like, you know, getting into, you know, morbid angel and, uh, you know, obituary and carcass and stuff like that, that was coming out. That was just like, the next level stuff and it was just like oh this is this is a little different faster a little uglier yeah. you know and uh i said i want to do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> what was the scene like in canada in, especially um, in like toronto as it <clears throat> well i know uh, yeah i know a lot of people like romanticize you know the past the nostalgia and like you know certain scenes and like mm -hmm. you know sure we have that here too uh it's not I mean, when people say, like, you know, we had Sacrifice and Slaughter, and then there was Overthrow and, like, Dark Legion and, like, a few other bands, and then there was, uh, but it was, it was very, um, those were the only other bands around. There wasn't really small other bands, you know what I mean? That's, that's the thing. So, like, there was, uh, there was, like, another side of Toronto, like, we're Mississauga, and there's, like, bands come out of there, but I don't, they were a little on the thrashier side. And, but I remember, you know, even when we were trying to find members to join, it was, mm -hmm. it was super hard. And, uh, you know, we lucked out with like finding certain members and having certain contacts and, 
you know, finding these uh, people like, uh, but it was, and if you did find someone, they were already in another band. Right. That's how small it was. It wasn't, it was very small and tight and, you know, like, it wasn't even like a, a scene as, as much as it was like the only before that there was like, you know, sacrifice and slaughter, like came in like a few years before overthrow. So it was like, uh, by then when we were doing overthrow, there was already kind of like those fans were already out there. Those people who are going downtown to shows were, you know, knew what's up and everything. Yeah. So it's just a little spottier than people think, but I mean, sure. So a lot of cool bands came out of here, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Was overthrow your first project? Um, the first one, that I was writing in and, you know, it was more, you know, control and everything. There was one other band before that. It was a bit more, it was more punk and, uh, I didn't write at all in that band, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun and we got on the radio and stuff. And so that also kind of set the bugs in motion too. Like it was just like, uh, Oh, uh, this is fun. You know, like yeah. uh, we recorded our stuff, stuff ourselves on a four track and, uh, we gave it to a guy and he played it on the radio and it was just like, wow, <laughs> you know, that was, that was pretty fun and mind blowing, you know, that we, that we got to do that. So, you know, obviously that was like a bug and it just kind of, you know, manifested from there really, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you currently have two projects now, nihilist death call and tribe of Pazuza. What uh, differentiates the project <clears throat> for you? Um, well, they're both like heavy and relentless. That's, that was the plan. You know what I mean? Like there was a uh, tribe of Pazuzu is, is basically what I want to hear from a death metal band. Mm -hmm. And that's how I write it. And, uh, it's, it's meant to be really relentless and, you know, just like, uh, just, 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 you know, bludgeoning. I don't know. You know, I'm trying to think of some adjectives here. <laughs> You know, like, a, like a, it's, it's very dark, it's fast, it's like, it's, a, you know, it doesn't let up at all. Like, there's this, that's all by design, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, I stripped out the uh, slow parts and the mid paced parts and the parts that were just, like, kind of drawing on too long. It was just like, why is this here? There's no point in it. The, the song doesn't need to be five, six, seven minutes long. You know, you can get your point across in much less time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and make it, like, tighter and, and more ferocious. So I don't even yeah. <laughs> this, you know, uh, and Nihilist Death Cult is is the same idea, except that it, the writing comes more from a hardcore uh, punk kind of background, like so the, the stuff we like to hear back in like eighty two to about eighty six. You know, like the the hardcore, just when it was getting into the crossover scene. But mm -hmm. when it was hardcore, it was it was still more in your face, fast. Uh, when they when they went crossover, which I did like the, a lot of crossover bands. You know, they, they slowed down a bit. They started writing longer songs and they, and it was just like, uh, you're doing good with the short songs to sort of suck with that, you know? Like, <laughs> but I mean, I'm not saying like crossover sucked or whatever, because I do like a lot of those bands and stuff like that. But I mean, for the model, for what I was, for the band I was doing though, was the 82 to 86, the fast yeah. hardcore punk and, and, uh, the length of the songs, it was just kind of dictated by our moods and feeling like we would play the song and, and it was like, you know, it would just sound like, you know, even if it was like 30 seconds long, like we would play it and to end it and we'd be like, yeah, that sounds like, a, you know, it doesn't need anything else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's all about moods and that band, like uh, how we feel. And we're just, and we're trying to keep it shorter too, because that's, yeah. that is the style. So. So let's focus in on uh, Tribe. How'd this project get started? <clears throat> About uh, 2016 was the end of like Soulstorm. I just kind of felt like that was like a, maybe the s second or third time I brought it around. And and I was just, um, you know, like uh, I, mean, I still had stuff to write. So I, I felt like, okay, let's do one more album or whatever. So we did that. And then, uh, and then it just kind of like fizzled out. And, um, I just thought that's enough of this really. Like, I mean, I kind of been doing it on and off for like 25 years, like, you know, and I just didn't want to keep beating a dead horse, you know what I mean? Like with that kind of thing. And, uh, and it is very uh, niche style. It's not yeah. like for everyone, uh, what Soulstorm was about. I mean, like, you know, and you can tell it from the same as we've been, we've been compared to Godflesh. So you could even just see how many Godflesh fans there are out there <laughs> compared to death metal fans. And it's, it's a yeah. lot. 
so because it, it's very different right i mean it's so it's like uh it has a nihilistic kind of edge to it which is a little bit different so i, I just uh i just thought it ran its course and i wanted to do something different and uh i never really explored as much uh of like the live band and live death metal stuff as i did like from the overthrow days because i went right into soul storm i didn't uh there was nothing in between or or you know uh other projects involved uh, that i was doing so the the time was right it was just it was kind of like it was too long from when i did stuff in the past and i was just like you know what it's time to start leaving some really proper things behind as a part of my writing legacy you know what i mean yeah. i wanted to kind of just you know do it properly and and just say like you know it just adds to the whole thing and instead of like just stop altogether right so yeah. it was just it was just time to switch it up and change and just do something that i wanted to do that i didn't do properly before yeah where'd the name come from um i wanted to you know of course be original because it's hard to be original uh, but <laughs> it's 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 still something that i think it happened i mean you hear people like scotty and some other people say like oh everything's been done and this and that and you know no more original stuff but i think you can still be original within the framework um of of what it is because uh, you know it just really comes down to the person and imagining and you know having an imagination and just being creative you know i mean <clears throat> sure a lot of things have been done i mean we're like like you know, we're almost up to 40 years of, of thrash and death metal now. So, yeah. uh, you know, and there's, and there's countless bands out there when, you know, now people are just doing it at home on their computer, right? Yeah. Mean, by one man bands, right. Just, just have an idea and do it. Uh, the software is easy to, you know, manage and it's all available now free. I always love Pazuzu and I've always had like this, uh, fun, you know, kind of like, you know, the imagery of it all. Like I just, I, I wanted to incorporate that finally and just, uh, just kind of like go all out. I didn't want to be like ho holding back and just uh, like, even the, the Pazuzu, uh, the reason I chose that is because it, it signals to other people who know about the cult and everything and know who Pazuzu is. And you know, the style, I think it kind of dictates the style a little bit too, like, yeah. you know, death metal or black and death metal and these kind of occult figures and stuff like that. It kind of goes hand in hand. So, <clears throat> and and a lot of people don't even know who Pazuzu is. Uh, this is another thing. He was he's kind of like an unknown known. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. would know. You've seen the pic. You've seen the shape, the pictures, the face, the wings, everything. You've seen him in movies and stuff like that. But no one knew his name. <laughs> you know what I mean? So now it's like uh, Pazuzu. I think like the past like four or five years that we've been doing this, I've seen Pazuzu references everywhere now. Like it's, uh, yeah it's a lot of places it's like it's it's very strange but now everybody knows who he is and you know they're they're sharing the pictures and stuff like that so uh but it's it's all uh and and you know i've said this before as well uh this comes down with the logo not necessarily the name but um you know choosing these kind of styles of logos too is is, is very specific to uh death metal and uh, yeah. it's, it's similar to like uh graffiti style and hip-hop how like you know if you're into that style you could read those logos and but if you're not in the style you can't you know you usually don't know what these right. logos mean or something like that so you know same with the death metal i think that this we have our own style our own clique of what we do and you know and that's uh you know it dictates the the the, the style too like you, you know you're gonna get something heavy something brutal yeah. the way the logos are you know yeah. so it's kind of fun like that too so so yeah i just put it together and just said uh tribe of pazuzu and i think that's, that's pretty original sounding and yeah. uh it went from there but, uh, you know, I, I think most logos, too, like, uh, are somewhat illegible until you know who they are. Yeah. Like, if you're a fan of that band and then you see that logo, like, the, like you know, just the shape of it looks, you're just like, okay, I know who that is. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and that's what it's about, really. Like, it's about identifying with the bands that you like, right? So and just kind of, you know, being a bit more invested in it than just, uh, you know, turn on the radio and there's your favorite pop song. Right, right. <laughs> You guys put out two EPs and King of All Demons came March 2020 and then the world shut down. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, COVID lockdowns really impact the, what the band was planning on doing? Um, well, once again, I mean, like touring with a, with, with something like this is, is takes more effort. Like we haven't even got to it yet because it's, it's like, uh, you know, I got to line up schedules with so many people. Right. And, uh, and of course, Flo and Randy are the most important of that. You know, I really need them to come out. Uh, 
Flo's been like living all over the place and uh, he's working on the second Ultimus album and then the new Cryptopsy's coming out. So um, we hoped that we wanted to tour as soon as the second EP came out, you know, because yeah. people were asking and uh, we had enough material now to tour because before that we only had like the one EP, which was like 15 minutes long. So we couldn't really get the gang together and, yeah. you know, uh, you know, go out for a 15 minute show. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so with the second EP, it made it like at least half an hour of material that we had. And we were like, uh, okay, let's go do some shows. And then psh, everything shut down even in, and it kind of affected it to, uh, releasing the album as well, because I mean, if it didn't lock down, the album probably would have been out last year. Hmm. Uh, but since everything locked down, there was a long period of time where the songs were sitting there kind of, uh, you know, um, there was no end in sight to the pandemic. Yeah. So it was like, we could record these songs, but then when they come out, if we're still in lockdown, it's going to be useless Mm -hmm. because the cycle is to, you know, record an album, put it out and tour. Right. So you have something to tour for. And that's like, and you know, then it's hard to put out an album and then you're still locked down and maybe like a year later tour, like, you know, that's not how people do it. And you know, all the initial press and PR comes out with like the, the, the release, right. Yeah. So you want to write that and you know, the reviews and while it's still fresh in people's minds and, but uh, yeah, I mean like, so it, it affects us a little bit like that, but not, not, not my personal life or anything like that. Yeah. I know a lot of people are like, uh, it changed how they live, but I always have kind of had like my own, reclusive thing going on yeah. the last 10, 10, 15 years or so. Yeah. Hey, you're like, I'm fine staying at home. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a problem with staying at home at all. Like I don't get bored. I mean, I have my, a lot of stuff yeah. that keeps me entertained that I like to do, you know, like uh, write songs, watch movies, whatever, you know, like read books. I have way too many books. I got to catch up on right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With death to all tyrants coming out uh, in December was, did you just spend a lot of lockdown time just writing? Uh, yeah, the whole time uh, we were focusing a lot on that. Like I, I did write all the tribe stuff. And like I said, I, I kind of let it sit. I let it kind of gestate a little bit. I was, I was making sure I didn't want to rush the tribe stuff either. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but in the meantime, I was getting itchy. Like, you know, so I, we were working on the NDC songs and me and my brother were going out and working them out all the time. Like I was uh, during the, the, the pandemic, there was one rehearsal place open and we would just go there all the time and uh, like at least once or twice a week and just uh, just you know have some fun and hammer it out and and we were shaping all that the what would become death to all tyrants and uh, it was it was a lot of fun and it's it, and it's like it's a completely different uh, vibe than tribe yeah but having said that i mean i think both would would probably fit on the same bill or they would probably appeal to most of the same fans i think both mm-hmm. bands but uh that's uh yeah so we took advantage of that like with with nbc with really kind of you know and we recorded during the pandemic too i think it was the tail end so we finally were like let's let's record now we're ready to do this and you know we got scott middleton who used to be a cancer bats and uh he produced it and that was like a wicked choice i'm I'm so happy that uh worked out because like i really i you know we combed a lot of the you know producers in, in the area and stuff like that for, for yeah for tribe i didn't i mean for sorry for ndc i didn't want to go too far out of the city like i do with with tribe you know what i mean i just wanted to kind of keep it a little bit local and use someone really good you know and uh so we combed the whole thing and uh we, we came up with scott and very happy with that decision so you know he really pushed us a lot and came captured what we were doing like you know so it was, it was good yeah yeah uh, aside from the musical difference do you approach writing lyrics differently for each project and what you want to say <laughs> I don't not the con the lyrical content yes not the style because yeah. like like I still write the same which is uh, like like thirty years ago I used to write all the lyrics first I had all these ideas you know and then you got pages of this will go with this and this will go with that and uh, but lately I've, I've I've had a different approach and it's more like um, um, I write all the music first. Sometimes you have ideas as you go, you know what I mean? Like, uh, oh, this this line will fit. Like, I'll have, like, uh, titles or uh, lines, a couple lines here and there. But I don't put everything together and complete it yet because I want to I want to fit to the music. I want the music to be first arranged. And it hardly ever changes after I add the the, the, 
the vocals. You know what I mean? Like some bands say, oh, it changes when I add the vocals and we added this part and we took out that part. But it's like, it's already pretty concrete. And you already kind of have an idea when you're writing. It's like, there's a verse, there's a chorus, there's a bridge, you know, and uh, so it's, it's, and then you just add the lyrics to it and it, it, it's been working out pretty good. So it keeps it fresh too. Like you're not just singing the same thing for like two years, yeah. three years. And then, you know, and then you, you know, commit it to tape. So it's like, uh, they're, they're just ideas up until we record in about, about a month before that's when I finish all the lyrics. And, uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun like that. <laughs> How'd you guys get connected with Vic Records? Uh, Vic Records, he's, he's mainly uh, an old school kind of um, a reissue guy. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, like older stuff that he puts out. That was mm -hmm. his main thing. And yeah. so he put out by the Overthrow CD, like the, the first band. And, um, you know, he's a big fan of that. And uh, so... Well, but when we, we did try, we didn't send it out to anyone. We didn't, we just kind of just approached it really uh, strange from our own end. And we just kind of like dropped the single, like, Hey, there's something new that we're doing, you know, like it was, it was still an all-star cast, but we didn't, we, we kind of were really quiet about the whole thing. So, but as soon as we dropped the first single, uh, rule from Vic records, he really loved it a lot. And he approached us about doing, uh, putting out the, the EP on CD and uh so just from there we we've just been working with him and it's been great and uh he's been super cool with everything and um you know i mean the only thing i could ask for would be like to you know some uh you know touring budget or yeah. stuff like that or, but you know other than that he's been super amazing and it's like uh, i love that he has the faith in what we're doing that you know he put it out so the the album came out last monday why a monday release <laughs> Uh, that was under out of my control. That okay. was uh, that was Vic Records as well. Like I, I asked him when is the release date, and he said uh, March sixth. And I said okay. And I didn't right. even look. At, I didn't even look at the calendar <laughs> at that time. Uh, because initially, it was the uh, March twenty fourth, and that that's the CD release date. Okay. And and then he said, uh, and I, but then we were talking. I said I still own the digital, and he's like, yeah, no problem. And so like you know, he he just does the CD part of it. Okay. So so and if we have vinyl, I, I I license it out to some other vinyl people too. Like it all goes to different people because uh, Vic Records just does CDs. So yeah, so he just gave me another date. He just said, oh, March sixth is, is coming out. And I'm like, and it started confusing me too. So I don't know why we have the two different. Uh, but also March sixth is the. Uh, the release date of the of the King of All Demons EP. It shares yeah. the same okay. birthday, so uh, nice. which is which is odd. Like I don't have like that many uh, releases that the yeah. same day. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah. I guess it's because of the same label and they have their certain uh, release dates that they they work with um, another company in the in uh, North America that that kind of sets that. I think. Yeah, I don't remember all the specifics. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, is it weird because you've been like putting out music and releasing for so long as like the industry has shifted and so much is like digital and like on Spotify and Bandcamp, like has it shifted how you approach each release and just like the way you look at music these days? Yeah, to a little, uh, to a certain extent, because um, that's why we started with the EPs. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a full album right away. We didn't want to waste time with doing a demo. Um, so we went right into an EP and, and the thing, the, and originally there was going to be three EPs. That was my idea. I don't know <laughs> why. Uh, but, but like the shorter format, I think is more in tune with what's going on and, uh, with, with people's attention spans these days. It seems like, uh, I don't, of course, a lot of people always chime in when I, when I say these things because, because I do, I do say them in the social platform sometimes. I make, you know, say opinions and, and of course, everyone's going to share their opinion with, the, with that. And, uh, a lot of people say they still love to listen to albums front to back, you know, like in yeah. one sitting and, and, uh, vinyl's even better because you get to flip it over. And, and I, I don't know. I'm like, uh, to me, it's just like, uh, I've, I've, I used to love making mixtapes mm -hmm. you know, in the 90s and uh, just, you know, my favorite songs and different bands. I like to listen to different things all the time. Like, uh, you know, that, it's very rare where I like to listen to the same band continuously for like half an hour or an yeah. hour or whatever. Like, it's just, it's never really been in my listening perspective. I guess it's similar to the radio, you know, where it's yeah. always a different song. But instead, I got my iPod and it's on random. So, uh, you know, just different bands, every song. So, it's... 
but so my listening tastes, is, you know, I guess they haven't really changed, changed, but like I, I noticed that, you know, like always have it like that it's one song. And, and I find if uh, sometimes uh, on a, on an album, some songs get lost, you know what I mean? Like the more songs you have on there, the more songs that could get like ignored sometimes, yeah. you know, or, or just like near the end of the album. Some people don't even go that far. I mean, even if you watch, uh, like Bandcamp, like you, they have the stats, and like yeah. by the time you get to the last song, you can see it has the least amount of listens. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, either people lose interest by the way, you know, it's like because it's a lot of songs too, right? So yeah, and uh, that's why I like the uh, the EP format. But I know uh, some people get upset. They're like, "Oh, I want more! I want more!" You know, and, which was weird because we, we when we dropped the second EP, it was a year later. It wasn't like two, three years later. Like mm -hmm. we it was like, "Here's five songs." A year later, here's another five songs, and everyone's like, oh, "I want more! We want more!" Like. What, I don't know what else to do. Right. <laughs> I just gave you 10 songs. But uh, so then, uh, then it was suggested like, instead of like the third EP, let's do an album this time, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and, and I, and I kind of fought it for a little bit because I was just like, ah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want songs to get lost. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, uh, cause like I spent a lot of time on it. So, but I think it worked out. I think it's uh, been keeping it to eight songs really gave it a nice uh, flow and uh, you know, just very, like a compact kind of like a, it's like a like a sledgehammer to the head The album's called Blasphemous Prophecies. What made you go with that title? That's a weird story because <clears throat> so the, the whole thing uh, when we around, I can't remember if it was just before King of Bell Demons or after, but uh, we were approached by Santiago from Triple Size Designs to do the Pazuzu uh, design. And uh, like he came to us and he was just like, oh, I want to do some art for you guys. You guys are amazing. I love the band. You know, both him and his manager Mark, they were they they were contacting us about all this, and then I said, "Well, we need a Pazuzu, I guess, because I don't have a Pazuzu drawing yet." And, yeah. and then they came up with one right away, uh, and it was awesome. I loved it right away, and it was just like this is this is wicked. So from there, we knew we were going to step it up with the artwork. Like uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was going to start getting a little more intricate and, and um, representing the band a little clearer. Whereas like the first two EPs, I think they were, they were striking, but they also had like a, like a, like a vagueness about it. Maybe, yeah. you know, there was, it left a little bit open, but I think now with the, with the art, it's, it's kind of says it more. So they were bugging me and they, they were like, uh, they said, we want to do the album cover. Cause they, so they heard me do some interviews and I said, I'm working on the album. And they said, we want to do the album cover. This was before I even had anything written. And they're like, "What's the name of the album?" So we could come up with the, with the the perfect artwork. And I was like, "There's no name. There's no songs. There's nothing." <laughs> so so give, give me a, a few months here. Like, let me work on something. And uh, actually, within a couple of days, I started thinking. You know, blasphemous prophecies kept sticking in my head, and I was just like, you know, that would kind of work. And and. I was using it to kind of like also guide everything into that. Uh, under that moniker, like, you know, like to have to write within that kind of uh, framework because I wanted to go a bit, a bit more occult. I wanted to go a little darker on this one. And uh, so that kind of set the tone a little bit as well. Um, so, yeah, the, so, and then they came up with the artwork and uh, I've been sitting on that for like two years and I love that art. I think uh, it's the most <laughs> thing, amazing thing I've ever seen. As soon as he showed it to me, I was just blown away. He showed me like one or two things before and it was just like, Getting there, getting there. I don't know what else to say. I just said, make it more blasphemous. <laughs> <laughs> and then they showed me this one, and it was just like, that's it, right? As soon as I saw it, I was just like, oh my god, that's the one. And I've been sitting on that for two years, just waiting to show everybody. Nice. And yeah. uh, you know, just, I'm glad everyone loves it now. You know, that's the seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the artwork's super rad. Yeah, yeah, it definitely sets the tone for the record. What uh, what were your influences or things you were drawing upon when you were writing lyrics for this album? Um, 
for the lyrics, I guess um, it's hard to write just like uh, dark lyrics if you if there's no like real uh, purpose sometimes or you know like you could just say put a bunch of words together and stuff like that. But then, <clears throat> and it wasn't on purpose that I that I kind of started writing about historical figures throughout time. Like it wasn't uh, premeditated, but then when those were the final lyrics and I said, I kind of dissected what they were about. I was just like, okay, these are about certain people throughout time. Like, you know, you got Nostradamus, you got Countess Bathory, you got, uh, even Pazuzu's in there and, uh, Yog Sothoth and, uh, and even Jesus. I mean, they're not evil figures, but there's, there's, uh, there's brushes with evil. There's a darkness about things that they were doing. Like, you know, the visions of, uh, Nostradamus and, uh, with uh, the trial and prosecution in that song, it's about like, you know, I got that from uh, the passion of the Christ where there's just, he's being brutally beaten for like the whole movie. And like that's, yeah. and, you know, just, and that, that, and like the whole betrayal of it all, it just are, um, you know, concepts that people could understand to a certain extent. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's where, where I wrote it from. Like, uh, I, but I tried to keep a, you know, a darker side of things because yeah. uh, that's to, to, you know, that's the, the sound, the imagery, the, you know, just to kind of really cement home of, uh, the, you know, like we serve under no God. I just wanted to open up with, uh, something really, uh, blasphemous to, to, yeah. to some people. I mean, uh, you know, it's not to us, it's just, you know, run the mill. Like, I mean, we don't, we don't believe, like, I don't believe in any religions at all. So mm -hmm. and that's kind of the point I want to get across. Just like do as thou wilt, you know, is, is, is more of a concept of like, you know, just living your life and, you know, just doing your thing and not really caring about yeah. other, you know, opinions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about earlier about how touring is difficult and, and not always, easy. you guys have plans to hit the road this year. I've talked to everybody. Everybody says, yes, Yeah, <laughs> they want to do it. I want to do it. Uh, I was hoping for the summer. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I would love to, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Are you just hoping for like a Canadian trek or over to Europe or in the States? Uh, I, we, we were talking about doing some kind of, uh, you know, like uh, something in the States for sure. I want to do something like either like an East coast tour or like Midwest East coast or, you know, I'd love to go out West for sure. But, uh, you know, I mean, it depends on what we could do yeah. and who's into it. And I mean, a lot of promoters have been contacting us about, you know, doing shows so it's just a matter of getting it all you know we can't do one-offs really it's kind yeah. of hard with this band that's the problem so we really have to you know uh focus and and, and plan something and, and and work towards that so uh hopefully we can we can do it in the summer that's the plan yeah. right now yeah yeah how have you felt about like the death metal scene as it's like it seems to be having a moment like in 2022, 2023, where it really has exploded, and especially with like the death core stuff with like Lorna Shore. Yeah. I think there, it seems like, uh, there's somewhat of, I don't want to say a resurgence because it never really went away. Yeah. But within definitely the last 10 years, it seems like it's, people have been a bit more receptive to death metal. Like I've never seen people like really eat it up like this before. Yeah. Like, uh, like it was always a tab taboo kind of, ugly thing like you know like oh that's that guy with that death metal band and <laughs> rah, rah, cookie monster vocals and you know and then you know they want their clean singing and nice pop songs right and uh you know they say they like metal but they can't get into that singing oh i don't know you know so it's kind of funny but uh i mean like i think it's it's definitely blown up a lot and especially when you hear people like everyone like loves black metal now it's yeah. just like I, I, I never heard anyone say that before like 10 years ago like <laughs> Like there was people who did like black metal and, you know, like I, I did know a lot of people like that, but I mean, the, the, the frequency you hear it now is just like, I never thought black metal was such a viable, you know, thing that people would, uh, you know, 16 year old girls would be wearing Burzum shirts on Instagram yeah. all the time. Right. Like, I mean, it's like, what, like, I don't remember any girls being into that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, so it's, it's, it seems a little weird, but, uh, you know, if it's happening, then, you know, it's, it is what it is. Right. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm happy for it. Uh, like it, and I, you, you know, I think now it's like, it's not only like, uh, the new bands you were talking about, but obviously like some of the older bands yeah. or people who haven't done stuff for a while, uh, you know, myself included, obviously like the, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, you want to step back into the arena and, you know, you have like a history and you, you, you know, 
you want to work with like-minded people. So you're also getting, I, I noticed a couple, like, I don't want to say super groups cause you know, but like, you know, yeah. people who have done stuff team up with each other and let's put out this album, let's put out this album, you know? And it's, uh, so it's, it's, it seems like the healthiest time ever, but it's also the weirdest time because it's like, there's all this, uh, all the cancel culture and all that stuff yeah. that's going on. And also the infiltration of like other types of music coming on right now, like this trying to change the core of it sometimes, like, which, you know, I mean, I guess I'm a bit of a purist like that, you know, like, so, uh, you, you know, it is what it is, you know, yeah. like what's happening. But I mean, the, the, the main point is that it is getting popular and, uh, you know, it's, it's not, part of the mainstream and I'm, I'm glad it's not because uh but you I mean you see people in the mainstream picking up on certain tropes of it all you know like i mean the, the t-shirts and uh the long hair like you know i guess that stranger things had like some kind of metal character or whatever yeah, you, know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know stuff like that and there's a couple more there's more metal movies now like in the last couple of years too like uh metal uh metalhead was one of them you know there's a few other ones and uh, death chasm and you know a few all these metal movies coming out it's just kind of weird uh you know even lords of chaos I, like that was more entertaining than factual but uh, you know what i mean like uh like i didn't mind it i don't have a problem with that kind of you know but i thought it was it was somewhat entertaining actually mm -hmm. and uh but that kind of stuff it's, it's it's selling it to new generations exposing people to these ideas that were always kept uh, underground or in the the back rooms i mean there wasn't you know i mean like you watch that party scene in uh in Lords of Chaos, and they make it sound like they like, look like this big social scene with tons of women and stuff like that. I don't think, you know, there was never no. a huge amount of women in that at these yeah. metal parties, you know. There was women there, but, you know, not when it got into the heavier stuff, but even then, there was women, actually, I remember, but it wasn't like the, the, the like, an equal thing, like, you know, it was still, like, some women liked it. It was like, oh, but it was still cool, you know. And yeah. I don't know, yeah, so it's, you get that kind of stuff happening in, in culture, you know, the, the things coming around and you know being exposed like years later and you know people see how it was yeah kind of fun Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our intro music was written and composed by Jeremy Hunt. The As the Story Grows theme is by Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe wherever you get your podcast and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can join us at patreon.com slash as the story grows. Be a part of our community and join the ongoing conversation over on Discord. If you enjoy this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I never felt so young and alive as when I'm diving into a tomb. And now I'm learning as I 